Arwen Shaw, speaking to a large gathering in Siroja Library. With him are Kitty Davy and Elizabeth Patterson. May 23, 1970. Delight for me to be here among the many uh, wonderful people, lovers of Baba, and so many new young people who are being attracted to Baba from all over, and uh, I know a great many of them find their way here to the center. We, that uh, Jean, my wife, and I hadn't been here to the center for nearly two years. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, we've been here many times in the past. But uh, I felt, uh, uh, upon arriving yesterday, that Baba's presence is very, very powerfully at work here in the center. Uh, even going, uh, just coming in from Briarcliff and going into Elizabeth's house, and sitting there, right away I began to pick up the feeling of Baba very, very strongly. And uh, a short time after that, uh, Kitty was very kind, and she let uh, Jean and I go in Baba's house for a few moments. And this was a wonderful gesture, because once we got in there, uh, we found that Baba was indeed in residence in his own home here at the center. His presence there is so powerful and so real that even if you do not see his physical body, uh, you know that he is the host here at the center. This is Baba's center. And it isn't something from the past, but something that continues to be in the present. And not only at Baba's house. Later on in the day, uh, we went to the barn for a few moments. And there again, it was as though Baba himself were right there to greet us uh, very warmly and uh, to act as host at his center. And even in the far reaches where we're staying, way out on the edge there, the Pine Lodge, uh, I was surprised there too that Baba's vibrations, his force, uh, just made one tingle all over. And I'm trying to say that as time goes on, my own feeling is that the force of Baba here at the center is not only not dwindling, but it seems to be coming more intense all the time. And I really do feel, and I'm sure that uh, I'm not saying anything new to most of you, that Baba is indeed here, working with each and every one who comes here. And it is a precious and a rare privilege to come here and to be able to absorb the atmosphere of Baba and to get reoriented toward the spiritual goal. Most of you know about Baba a great deal. There may be some who are just getting sort of an introduction to Baba. So I'd like to say that even though it is a large order, uh, something uh, rather difficult perhaps for those who are attached to orthodox belief uh, to accept. And nevertheless, we feel that Meher Baba incarnated the infinite reality. And even though he was in physical incarnation and we had the great joy and pleasure and privilege of being with him physically, and feasting our eyes upon his spiritual and physical beauty, and having the, the great joy of loving embraces from him. So, all along, he kept telling us that I am infinite consciousness, I am not the body. And uh, this was rather hard for us to really grasp at the time, because his body, his face, uh, the spiritual radiation was so great and so beautiful that it was hard and is still hard for us to, to think of him in any other way except as the body we knew. And we're not wrong actually in doing this. Though he is infinite, immeasurable, timeless, he took on the body as did all other forms of the avatar so that we would have this focal point to think about to love, and thereby to draw closer to 
the infinite reality. The avataric form, then, is the doorway to the infinite. So when we think of the avatar and love him, we are growing toward the doorway to God. Mayor Baba always made it clear to us that his experience is that he is eternally and unendingly one with each one of us. So as far as he is concerned, he never has to become one with us. He already is one with us. But we simply have to realize this fact which already exists. In other words, he, the infinite reality, or if you prefer the divine beloved, or God, the infinite, is already one with us, is already latent within us. And we must become conscious of him within. The wonderful thing about Meher Baba's physical presence, which impressed so many, was his love. Never has man experienced this type of love outside of the presence of the avatar. Divine love is simply beyond any description, and uh, it is something that makes an indelible and timeless impression upon a person. And uh, in the case of Meher Baba, his love was so great that he became a, an ir almost irresistible magnet uh, to everyone uh, in his area, his vicinity. Even among the Baba lovers who came to be with him for Darshan program and for Sahaba, uh, it was oftentimes only with some difficulty that uh, the lovers uh, practiced their uh, well-learned sense of discipline and refrained from crowding up around him to embrace him, uh, to be close to him and uh, near. Uh, this is something that was almost irresistible. Uh, but in spite of... Uh, our, our well-trained and well-exercised discipline, fortunately, each one of us did manage from time to time to be close to him and to be the recipient of his loving path, loving embraces. And even in the distance when we weren't close, his thoughtfulness and consideration for the needs of his lovers uh, was felt in the response of his love glances. He could find you in the crowd, each one, and respond to your heart's need with his love plan. And the unique thing about his love was and is that each one was made to feel that his contact with Baba was a very personal one, a very intimate one, one that was extremely important to Baba. And of course you knew it was important to you. But uh, this is the thing that he was always able to convey to the individual. And there were little experiences that went on between the lover and Baba, little things that would happen. In fact, this was the fabric of the cloth of our relationship with Baba. Uh, the little contact, the little things that would happen, little incidents through the time we were with him physically, and uh, incidents that happened inwardly that uh, made us feel and know that his love for us as individuals was a very real thing, and is a very real thing, and that we could have confidence in him and trust him more and more until we reached the point where we would dare to plunge into the ocean of his love. He also often said that uh, the spiritual path does require daring. And uh, this can be interpreted in many ways, of course. And in our backgrounds, I think each one of us, uh, through the experiences of life, acquires some experience in the lines of daring. And this may stand us in good stead when we approach and try to travel uh, the path of love toward the Divine Beloved. 
because we are so much inclined to like to safeguard ourselves <coughs> from uh, hurt, from uh, insecurity, and uh, to, uh, to uh, perhaps unconsciously maintain the security of the ego, which we intellectually know stands in the way of our real freedom. But through love, through Baba's love, we are encouraged to actually believe the things he said, that it is possible to step out of the little self and to discover for, for a real fact that we are indeed timeless, that we are not the body at all. Baba said that he is not the body. He also said that we are not the body. And this, we, we say yes, 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 yes. But all the time, we act and behave quite the opposite. Uh, we indulge the body in one way or another almost all the time. Uh, but uh, even, even though we do indulge it uh, consciously and unconsciously, Baba wants us to somehow and perhaps gradually get used to the idea that we really are not the body. He doesn't want us to neglect the body, take good care of it, but uh, more and more to realize that we are not the body, that we are something that is timeless and by true nature really free. While in the body we are so much addicted uh, to the play of the opposite, Baba calls this duality. And at the dual level where we have the opposites at play, Gain and loss, beginning and end, good and evil, uh, happiness and misery, all of the opposites, one who could go on perhaps for hours naming opposites. When we fall into the mistaken belief that what we really seek is at that level, so here we are finding ourselves struggling at the level of opposites to try to find something that is timeless and eternal. We are seeking for real happiness, lasting happiness and the sense of the real being, the real truth. Fortunately, Baba has explained, it is fortunate that he comes to explain, that what we really seek is not to be found at that level. We can go on as we have gone on, not only through this incarnation, but through any number of incarnations, seeking at the level of the opposite for the truth. And the truth is not at the level of the opposite. We have to begin to gradually withdraw from the level of the opposite, from duality. And this is made possible through loving God, through loving the Avatar, the Divine Beloved, and through finding something far more substantial in that love than we find in the opposite. We are victimized by the opposite. So that we think at times that we are bad, and we also think at times that we are good, and we think at times that we are miserable, and we think at other times that we are very happy. And uh, we base all of these conclusions upon experiences of the opposite, at the dual level. This is where consciousness is ordinarily entrapped. Baba often said, don't worry, be happy. Such a simple thing to say, but uh, not so easy to actually do. But it conveyed in its simplicity a great spiritual secret. It unveiled a mystery in which we, we may participate, uh, a mystery which we may uh, practice and find therein some measure of liberation. By ceasing to worry, even in the face of things which say we must worry, we are asserting something greater than the opposite. The opposites of life say, now you must worry, or now you can be happy, now you must be sad, and uh, now you are bad, now you are good, and all of these things. Baba says, don't worry, be happy. He is saying, assert happiness, do not worry. He is saying that we have an ability to exercise a faculty of not worrying in the face of things which say we should worry. 
This means that worry which would depress the heart uh, need not be indulged in. That we can keep our spirits up. That we can be happy even in the face of things which say, no, you can't be happy. It's impossible to be happy now. But he is saying we must assert happiness in its true sense. We must also, he says, assert truth. And we must also assert pure love. We cannot just sit back and say, well, maybe it'll happen. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. We have to become positive and make the effort to assert the real in the face of the poor. We need not be victimized by the tyranny of the opposites any longer. The opposites will continue, of course. But we, by true nature, are the soul. And the soul is eternally free, eternally pure, eternally united with God. And through loving Baba, and drawing closer to him in this love, and making the effort to assert being happy in his love, we will gradually get free from the bondage of duality or the opposite. I like to think that this is the allegorical meaning of the saying in the book of Genesis, with which nearly everyone is familiar, <coughs> wherein Adam and Eve are in the garden and uh, God is said to have said to uh, Adam and Eve, you may partake of the fruit of all of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not partake, for when you do, you will surely die. I like to think that this is an allegory of the opposite, of duality, that when we indulge in duality, we lose the Edenic or free state, and that when we relinquish duality or the opposite, it becomes possible for us to again enter the Edenic or free spiritual state. Well, well, Baba does help us along this line. It is. It means work. You see, we we will no longer be just drifters and being tossed back and forth from one opposite to the other. We will begin to work toward truth, hand in hand with the divine beloved. He isn't coming down to make us comfortable at the level of the opposite. He gives his hand to lead us out of the opposite and into a higher, freer level of freedom. But even in the midst, even though the opposites continue, paradoxical though it <coughs> we can experience, by degrees, more and more freedom from them. You follow? Clear? Now, Baba's attractiveness, I wanted to dwell a little bit on that. Uh, there were times when... Uh, well, I recall one time at the East-West Gathering, for example, in 1962, when there were some 4,000 Indian Baba lovers there and uh, over 200 Western Baba lovers. And uh, they were in this large pandal. Most of you saw the movie last night with all of these people there. And even though Baba just seemed to be sitting there and his head swaying to the music, and sometimes when the people came forward, they were having their contact with him, but his love radiation was unfolding, enveloping, permeating everyone there. And another factor, which was not shown in the movie and couldn't be, was the love of each lover for the beloved as he sat there before them and as they came up to have their contact with him. So that there were mighty forces that were in that pandal during that time, as there always is around Baba, mighty forces of love. And on this one occasion, toward the end of the first day, the forces were so great that uh, my feeling was that uh, I didn't quite understand what was happening at the time, but it seemed like all the forces of nature were just bent on rushing wildly into the awesome beauty of Baba's all-consuming love. It was just something uh, unbelievable. And this is what... Uh, often happened around Baba. 
the, uh, the not only the divine beloved giving the love, but the love of the lovers for the divine beloved. On these very grounds, through many occasions when the beloved was here, we walked with him over these grounds, stood here, sat there, and uh, little incidences happened to this one and to that one. You saw him reaching down to kiss a child here, to embrace another person there, a little pat there, or a love glance somewhere else. And these were personal things that uh, were uh, like rays of, of beautiful light uh, for each one who was the recipient. And the exchanges of love were always going on. These are continuing to this day, as each one here, I hope, well knows. Baba is every bit uh, as, as active and uh, as animated in his work for his lovers as he ever was when he was in the physical body. And he responds just as wholeheartedly to their needs and their, their aspirations and their love, wherever they are. He is there responding and able to reach and to help each one in his need, whatever it may be. So again, the daring comes in to, to dare to enter more fully into Baba's love, to experience more fully his love by giving more of our own. It means giving up the solar plexus center, if you know what I mean, and coming up into the heart center to function more from the heart center and to open the doors of the heart. Actually, this is what Baba helps happen, helps to bring about. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say help. <laughs> Baba brings about the opening of the heart center, which means that we must love. We learn to love through loving, not through talking about it, through reading about it, through agreeing it's a wonderful thing. We only learn to love through loving. No matter how difficult it is at first, no matter how limited, how faulty, uh, it is only through loving that we learn to love. And the heart must function as love. I mean, even if we can only love just a little bit today, and maybe a little more tomorrow, little by little, our attunement with Baba can be a very wonderful one. And it is all on the basis of love. Love has within it far more revelation than intellectual learning or understanding. The true love has great insight within it. And it opens up, it is possible or capable to open up uh, levels, to unlock levels within us which may lie dormant at present, which may, we may not even know that we have. We do, each one of us, have levels within which are great which give us un, unmeasured freedom and in which we may experience beauty beyond our dreams and the real spiritual riches so that by comparison the worldly values are more easily relinquished. It is not for the saints of old, uh, the, the um, ascetics and those who go to the caves and the cloisters to just give up the world and seek God. And Mayor Baba came so that we would understand that this is meant for each one of us, wherever we are, whatever our place in life, and that we should not feel that we have to run away from life, whatever our job is, whatever our destiny is. We must go ahead with our job and our destiny and fit in wherever our place is, but know that God can be experienced there, that we can love him that it is possible for us to experience him there, in the midst of everything. Because the false cannot supersede the truth. It is quite the contrary. The truth is the real power, the real authority. And wherever we are, no matter what the situation, we must assert and live by the truth. And this is best done by inviting, evoking, loving, the divine love of the Master. It's something that we don't do alone, we can't do alone. We can do with his help, by holding his hand, by thinking of him, by loving him, as much, as often, as possible. It becomes our greatest joy. <coughs> so, um, 
maybe I've spoken enough on this theme. Now perhaps mm -hmm. someone might have a question or something else they'd like to have me talk about. Anyone like to ask something? Not to know about me. Yeah. As far as gross desires for different things, uh, what is, I mean, like, uh, say uh, uh, you want to go out and uh, you'd like to buy a new car, is this, uh, is this being practical or is it... Uh, this being practical, like, yes, this is one of the things that, that uh, we have learned through the years with Baba, that uh, he was very, very practical, and uh, by staying with Baba, we discover that we must become very practical that uh, uh, we must face these things, uh, the, wherever we live, the things we must encounter, we must deal with them intelligently and in, in a positive way, in a very practical way, yes. Is it wrong to enjoy sensation? Well, this is, there's no pat answer to these questions. <laughs> you see, <coughs> what is right for one person is not for another. Mm -hmm. It depends upon uh, your own values, you see. There comes a time when each one of us as an individual is, is uh, normally and naturally inclined to wish to indulge in the love of God in preference to many other types of indulgence, you see. So it's, it's a matter of, uh, of growth. Paul said that we have to become gradually mature in his love. It is a matter of maturing. And this is something that we cannot actually hasten uh, too much but still, perhaps we can do something toward maturing in his love. Uh, other, another way of saying is growing up, uh, as, you know, little by little, becoming more... May I answer yes. that question? Now, Baba, it, you're speaking of buying a car. Well... Uh, now, may I say this? Baba says there's nothing wrong in money itself. It's what you do with it. So let's apply it to the car. What are you going to do with the car? Is it solely for yourself? It's whether it's, um, is it going to be a selfish thing? Are you going to use it for other people? That's applying uh, the teaching to it. Now, are you going to be selfish or unselfish with it? Mm -hmm. well, after all, you have to get around. There's nothing wrong. You don't want to go back to a horse. Baba rode his car. Is it maybe you'd like to say more though? That, that might have well, what I meant by sensations is just recently I started skydiving. And, uh... <laughs> well, there again, we spoke of daring. Uh, actually, uh, actually uh, things like that could be a good background. Uh, you might be interested to know, if you, if you don't already, that uh, Dr. William Duncan, who wrote the wonderful book, The Wayfarers, uh, was himself quite an adventurer as a young fellow. And uh, he, on one occasion, rode some 1,400 miles across the Sahara Desert by camel during the heat of the Sahara summer. And uh, he did a bit of mountain climbing, things like that. So that uh, he's just one of uh, Baba's close mandalay. But this is a very physical means of acquiring uh, this type of background. Uh, it may be your, your need to, to acquire it in this way. I don't know. May I, this made me think of something else. It's strange that he mentioned a car. There is a gentleman, a lady that came down today that had a car that Baba rode in how many years ago? Before 51. In 51. Yeah. And Baba rode in it and told them that they should never sell it. They came down in the car, so if anybody wants to see the car that Baba rode in, <laughs> and they can still come down in it. Uh, and that's an interesting point. May I say something about that? Oftentimes the, uh, the question arose, should you buy a new car or not? And again and again, Baba has uh, uh, brought home to us the, uh, the uh, fact that the need wasn't there. The one was there, but not the need because he had the car, but his orders. <laughs> no, they didn't have the car, but it all can happen. Not too much chance to use it. We have the car, and we don't need another car. Once the car has given up its uh, life, then I have to buy a car. Then the need becomes uh, apparent. But one thing is one thing, and the need yes, is another that's thing. That's another thing. Father has said, the need is yes. Yes. You'll get what you need. Yes. I'll give you that. If you live out here and have to go to town ten miles, you need a car. If you live in an apartment building in New York, well, you can very rarely park it anyway, but you need one to come down here. <laughs> well, now we go on to it some other well, That reminds me of the, uh, the old saying, you're all familiar with it, he was tried and found wanting. 
which, <laughs> which has a which has, which has a, uh, a peculiar ambiguity, uh, especially relevant to the spiritual path. It, it's wanting in the sense of just wanting, you see. <laughs> Father did always press, because he was very keen on quoting from the Bhagavad Gita, where needs, you may have your needs, but cut out as many wants as you possibly can if you want real happiness. Not this, Father says, and not that. That, Baba says, is the only way to true happiness. Well, could I say this, that Baba had us learn this very uh, <laughs> gradually, because what seemed to be our, our needs at one time, and that was the first time that we went to India, and he said that we were to stay a year, so we thought of all the different things that you couldn't get in India, and of course at that time there were not planes, so we each took an innovation trunk, and we took everything that you could possibly think that anybody that goes to another country like that wouldn't be able to get, we filled it, they were so heavy, and uh, then uh, we arrived, and Baba said we should look our best, that was the first time uh, that we were there, and thereafter he said, and now we'll go with bedding rolls up to Kashmir. We left the innovation trunks and all that we had in them and went with bedding rolls, do you see? So and then we realized uh, that they just stood there, so the time when we came back, we hadn't used them at all. Robert didn't say. He didn't tell us to bring everything we had, but that was what we thought we needed, you see. But he showed us we didn't. And then, of course, the contrast between the ashram we went to in Nasik when on our second visit to India and what followed afterwards, which was the uh, austere ashram on Merabad Hill. Baba didn't put us into the austere ashram to begin with. He put us in Nasik, which had individual bedrooms, individual bathrooms, had ice cream and lovely cakes for tea, and uh, had a cook to cook for us, somebody to wash up for us, and well, Baba called it the luxury ashram. And he lasted <laughs> for six months, because he said, if I had asked you to come straight away into an austere uh, surroundings, I couldn't have worked with you. You would have been so miserable. You would have said you were hungry. You must go down to the bazaar and get yourself more food. And he said, I couldn't have worked with you in the way that I wanted to. To satisfy all your wants at that moment was what I had to do for you to learn certain lessons that I wanted to teach you. And when those lessons were learned, and after, oh, I hope they were a little bit taken in, shall I say not learned? No. After six months, then Baba closed that um, uh, luxury ashram. He sent some back to the West, and I suppose those he thought who were ready for an austere ashram, where you lived on rice and dal and never went out of the compound and didn't read or write or um, do anything of that kind, then Baba took us for the remainder of our time in India up to America, which was an austere ashram, which didn't have any of those wants, only had your needs. But so you see, again, it's a relative question. Baba doesn't want you all suddenly to start selling all that you have mm -hmm. and going to live with just one garment and a set one garment and the begging girl. That's not Baba's way for all of us. If that, that time ever comes, that that is for you. Individually, Baba will let you know that. But it is not the spiritual path that Baba has chosen at this particular time. Well, may I go on from what you're saying, yes. Kitty? Because then we went to uh, Maribad on the hill. And of course, when you're with Baba, you really feel you're in the center of everything. You don't feel the way everything else is away, but Baba is in the center. And after he got used to that, it, then he, he told me and some others, you go back to where to the West, go back to New York City, go back to that life. And it was much more difficult to go back than it was to be over there. And then it, all your friends see you that you really don't look a bit more spiritual than when you <laughs> Wings <laughs> but we did come back to the difference because it isn't that anything Baba minds at all. In fact, if we have guests at the party and Baba was, the very best things are put on the table and more than enough to eat. Baba never skimped if he was inviting people there. But what Baba did want us to be was detached whether we had it or not. Sleep on a bed if you have it, but if you don't have it, be quite as happy sleeping on the floor. Have meat and good things if you can afford it. If you can only afford to have rice and a little chapati, be equally happy with it. Then Baba doesn't mind anything, whether it's smoking, even if it's a glass of wine sometimes, as long as you are not its slave, and provided that you can also do without it. I mean, Baba's so flexible, don't you? Know, couldn't do. I also tell it another thing, that when uh, we started on the blue bus trip, again, we put in so much in our bedding rolls, you see. Here we come down, this was several years later, but we put in everything that we could think of. We were going to be born for six months, 
and we saw these men just shrugging, you see, to put the, on the top of the bus. And then they put a canvas over it. So when we arrived, Baba said, oh, well, they can't take that all down in there, so they will just sleep on the floor. <laughs> and so we went in. You see, there's no furniture, practically no furniture. And then he turned to me. He had a wonderful way. He turned to me and he said, and you, Elizabeth, have uh, uh, driven the bus, and you must be tired. I'll give you a special place. I'll let you sleep on the dining room table. <laughs> And then we ended on the rest of the tour having only a little suitcase and the blanket which was going to cover us or serve as a cushion we sat on in the bus, 30 people in the bus, and no bedding rolls would be taken down from one place until we arrived at another place for a long stay. So there's huge bed rolls back on the top of the bus, stay there sometimes four days, so we could take them down. All we had was a little suitcase with a metal cup and a plate and a toothbrush. But you see, you learn what the Italian uh, uh, Latin word for impedimenta, that's baggage, mm-hmm. it's impedimenta. And the first place that we went in where we slept, no, the second place we went in was the town. And when we got in, they said, you know, all the lights are out. And finally, after a while, we didn't know it, but it was our baggage. <laughs> Coming in from the truck, and it dropped down the line. We weren't having anything up there. So, uh, so after a while, my little, you learn through doing. <laughs> so we had to have candles because of all our baggage. <laughs> In other words, we carry a lot of excess baggage with us. In many ways, in our minds. Yes, in our minds. Any other questions? Yes? You were talking about duality before. Duality. What about a duality within? That is where, that's what we're talking about, the duality within. See, this is where we get ensnared in these values. And Baba says a basic truth is that underlying everything there is oneness there is really no separateness and uh, truth is one and uh, you see we get we allow ourselves to be swayed that's why we are miserable and uh, happy as a result of of uh, relative experiences outer experiences in relation to a physical body you see and in time we can mature so much that we do not swing from one end to the other quite so far. In other words, we're not quite as depressed from one extreme and we're not quite as happy because of, of uh, a materialistic thing. So that after a while we get more poised and it becomes less important to us so that we don't get disturbed so much by the outer. We become more oriented to real values within. You follow? Yes, Ron? In relation to the other avatars, what do you think it means if Baba said, I have not come to teach and to awaken? Yeah, that's a very, it's always been a good question. What does it, Baba, mean when he said, I have come not to teach, but to awaken? Uh, well, we see so many evidences. For example, now that he has dropped his physical body, uh, people begin to look for something to, to form into a, a doctrine or a creed or a system. They can't find it. He did not leave things that could be formulated into creeds and doctrines and systems. He did not wish to establish a new religion. And he took great pain to make sure that this could not happen. So there are already too many religions. It is time that we have God, you see. And his way was not of teaching, although he did explain, give endless discourses, marvelous gems of discourses, his real work was and is awakening within. Awakening of what? Awakening of our uh, discovery of the urgency of the need for a spiritual unfoldment, of our plight caught in the maze of the ignorance of the falls, and uh, the, the groping towards something real, you see, and awakening within us our longing 
to be near him and even to merge with him because this is indeed our destiny eventually to merge with him and this awakening uh, may involve many things uh, I mean all of those who have been with Baba have uh, found that they've been plunged into uh, uh, phases of, of deep struggles to grasp significance of what was happening and uh, to, to tear away veils and to, to, to be able to function at the r rare altitude uh, where he was and is because uh, once one has any, even a taste of, of the pleasure, the joy of his company, nothing else satisfies. I mean, <laughs> so that uh, this is something of well, what he means by the awakening. Each one must struggle with this question. We are meant to struggle with it, you see. We're not always supposed to have pat answers. We, we must struggle. Yes. I would like to tell what I think it means. Please do. I think that uh, Baba wants us to come awake to the world that he is creating. That uh, it would be a wonderful thing if, for instance, I could get rid of my own fantasy of a world and just... or. That, that is something we're sharing. There is a there is a, a, a kind of objective world which Baba created, which uh, one's own uh, self concern and self problems uh, keep one from even participating in. And that's uh, to me a great uh, goal for for uh, enough of a goal for man to uh, come awake to uh, a group world. Yes, so I think what she's saying, if I can identify that a little bit, um, is that <clears throat> the, the, um, we tend to project uh, outward towards the world our own idea, our own prejudice of what kind of world we think it should be. And uh, almost everybody in the world today feels that it isn't the kind of world that one would want. But somehow we have to come to terms with the fact that it must be, at this particular moment, the kind of world that Baba wants for his purposes, which we cannot understand. Well, this is a, a very important point, I think, Lynn. And I, I think it's good to get the point of view of, of, uh, of many people who have been around Baba and been thinking about him for a long time, because each one seems to have a little different point that uh, contributes toward uh, the whole theme. But a point in connection with that, uh, which I, I'd like to uh, mention, is that in the times of Jesus, uh, many people think of those times as idyllic, that uh, Jesus was walking uh, the hills of Galilee and everything was wonderful, not realizing that at those times, those people were under the tyrannical heel of an invader, and that invader was there with all of his, his atrocities and his force of arms, and uh, these people were being subjected to all sorts of things. And uh, it was a, really a terrible external world to be in at that time. <coughs> and many people thought that this man, Jesus, was going to lead them into an overthrow of of the uh, Romans and lead them on to uh, exterior freedom. But the interesting thing is that in the midst of all of this, Jesus came to point the way toward inner poise in the midst of all of that and toward thinking about God and only God and loving God. Even if he didn't say you have to wait until everything gets nice and harmonious and pleasant and everything. But in the midst of a situation which was almost unbearable, intolerable, uh, he comes and tells them to love God and actually was leading people toward the realization of God in times like that. So we shouldn't be too disturbed about what's happening in the world now. The goal is still the same. Yes? Um, I want to say that come up, especially in large cities with young Baba lovers, is uh, a natural... Uh, response very often to uh, the terrible things they see around them uh, and a tendency to sometimes think that they would like to join in in such things as a uh, peace movement, etc. Um, and I uh, 
would appreciate your commenting on, on that more directly. Well, this is a very uh, trying question right now, I think, for Baba lovers. Because uh, sometime in the past, many may not know about this, Baba advised his followers to keep out of politics. And as far as I know, he never revoked that. Uh, from his point of view, I'm sure that uh, these things are, on a larger scale, opposites at play. Part of the dual play, you see. And Baba's lovers uh, are trying to get free of the opposite. He doesn't mean, and I don't think he meant, that they should uh, not try to help things in the world in any way that they can. But I don't, I personally, this is my own feeling, I don't think that uh, he wanted his followers to identify him with any particular exterior movement, you see, because he is essentially for everyone and everything. And this is this includes some pretty <laughs> diametrically opposed opposites. <laughs> Baba sometimes put things very simply. Yes, yes. And when I understood him to say in regard to politics, he didn't want, that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't vote or any of those things of that kind, but to go into politics because to be thing, you have to be against something else. The duality that you get into deeper instead of the unity. Baba's point the way to oneness. I was, uh, and not to hitting somebody, you don't get to oneness. You, you know, oh, yes. well, but I, I, if you saw somebody that was hit, that's no sign you shouldn't help them. We're for oneness and against duality. What's that? We're for oneness and against duality. You can't be. You really have uh -huh. you never <laughs> felt that Baba, in oneness, that Baba was for one people more than another. He never thought he was more for me than he was for Kitty, or he would be more for this little girl than he is for you, or he'd be any, more for anybody. Or one country. Or one another. country. Mm. And even, and I the quote this, when we were in India, and, they, and um, the Chinese were coming over the border, and you know he's very uncomfortable to be in a country with an enemy just coming over the mountains. And they said, Baba, oh, this is terrible. Baba just smiled at them, and he said, and I am also in the Chinese. <laughs> Maybe. He's yes. in the soul. I didn't mean to say he's in them as a uh, individual. He's in them as their political, because he's not in them in their political, but they have a soul. Everyone has a soul. He's in their soul. Do you want to ask something? Yes, yes. Well, I just, uh, this Saturday, I'm going to receive a degree in political science, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I tend to think one of the reasons I went into it was because I felt like uh, that if you could end some of the, the strife and uh, 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 problems within people and uh, between people, uh, end some of the poverty which uh, separates people, uh, the, uh, the uh, war, the, the crime, and things like this, that you would be doing something which would be good for, for uh, mankind as, as a one, and not just you know yourself or uh, just a selfish desire. And if you can get into politics and do something like this, I can't, I, I can't see, uh, maybe, you know, I think that the, the crime is wrong. I think that killing someone is wrong. Uh, I, I think that the, these things are definite uh, things which Baba would not be in favor of. So how can you, how can you say that, that don't get into politics don't do these things because you have to say go against something. I think even Baba when it had had thoughts against something. Well, he was thinking of his close disciples. Of course, the world as a whole. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that is something. Those that are under discipline with Baba, it wouldn't be necessary. But on the other hand, to help, if you can help, Baba always wants us to help, no matter how. But you don't have to be in Agnew's position. In fact, I think you can help better than he does. Don't you think the <laughs> 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 the motive changes? With Baba, he says it's so much more the motive with which you do everything. Some people go into politics for power, for greed, for a name. But you just now said you were going in because you wanted to help mankind. You see, I think there is Baba. Don't you think so, Fred? Well, I don't know what politics you're speaking of. Well, I think even Baba has, uh, 
far as duality is uh, for Agu, I think he's put people like uh, Abby Hoffman and uh, the Chicago Seven on the other side to uh, to make it. Uh, <laughs> There's always been people like them in the world. May I, may I comment briefly on that? Uh, I think one of the big problems, of course, is it depends upon the particular way you envision your relationship to the avatar. Now, on the closest level, Baba says that to love him, to try to surrender to him, is to serve the universe in a much more total manner than any possible project that the individual personality may envision getting involved in. So that if we are in the process of drawing close to Baba, but still not to the point where he seems to be indeed the, the one reality, it is not true when we see some of the apparent, uh, the great ignorance, the apparent evil of the world, to want to get in there and join this movement or that movement. But what happens, of course, is that our consciousness gets caught up in being in this group versus that group. While Baba says that actually, though we might not do a single thing in terms of actually sending out uh, a literature about uh, uh, ending uh, the draft or this or that, we're going to be much more used to bring about the ultimate goal, which is liberation for the soul, by simply loving him than by getting caught up in the duality of politics. Because one of the mechanisms of creation is that there will always be souls entering the human form at various levels of spiritual evolution. And younger souls have heavy, heavy deposits of the pre-human experiences, pre-human sanskaras, of lust, anger, greed, and that we can never really expect in terms of uh, creation, in terms of for, for all time, a world of eternal peace. Because, after all, the conflict that we see on the international level is simply the collective manifestation of the egos of individuals on a singular level. That is, our institutions mirror the collective consciousness of our people. And that the ultimate, the ultimate solution is liberating one's own, oneself from one's own ignorance through surrendering to the one reality that those who come to Baba perceive in Baba and thus becoming senses of love which liberate others because they are feeling something much more than they could ever feel by any amount of movements, by any amount of involvement in particular movements. But that's not to say that the peace movement or anything else is being put down, because undoubtedly those souls who have not yet reached the, have not yet accepted this particular path as being the ultimate path one must travel, are preparing themselves to travel this path through their life of service and concern in the various movements in which they find themselves. But for those who come to Baba, <laughs> ultimately, when one feels it's right within himself, one will find that one can be of much greater effectiveness in bringing about a greater world of love through simply surrendering to the avatar and bringing that love to whatever position we find ourselves in, whether it be a teacher or a waitress. It doesn't matter. Because all things are equally vehicles of spiritual awakening once you make contact with the infinite source. <laughs>